Hello everyone, I'm Saray Rowe. I'm going to be the MC for tonight. I'm a proud Yorta Yorta and Kulin woman. I currently work at the University of Melbourne and I'm proud to be a local shepherd and woman. I would like to welcome you all to the 10th annual Dungala Keila Oration and I would like to say it is a special night to be holding this oration on Yorta Yorta country. I want to play a special welcome to the Yorta Yorta elders that are here with us tonight and all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders that are present. I would also like to acknowledge the other dignitaries in the room, including the chairperson of the Yorta Yorta Nations, Uncle Lance James, the 2018 Dungala Kayla Arada, Morna Jackson, the co-conveners of tonight's oration, Uncle Paul Briggs and Professor Glenn Davis, Ani Jill Gallagher, the Victorian Advancement Commissioner, James Atkinson, the CEO of the Rumbalara Aboriginal Cooperative, Justin Muhammad, the Commissioner of Aboriginal Children and Young People, Deborah Cheatham, Tony Lalich, and the Dungala Children's Choir, Jarwin Executive Leaders, the Mayor of Greater Shepparton, Kim O'Keefe, Councillors Fern Summer and Chris Hazelman, leadership from the Kayla Institute and my colleagues from the University of Melbourne. I would now like to introduce Ani Rochelle Patton, Belinda Briggs, Uncle Graham Briggs, and my little cousin Dira Briggs to give the welcome to country. Rochelle Patton. Gaunya Yobuganarag. Did this one work? Yes. Sorry. Ngata, <laughs> Belinda Briggs, Yori Yora, Wamba Wamba Winya. Before I share with you some important words. I'd first like to pay my respects to all of you here this evening, my family, especially elders here today, special guest Moana Jackson and dignitaries present. Also pay my respects to Sharon Atkinson Miller, who for the last five or six years, through Kaili Institute's language revitalization program, Yalkaloich Ba mentored and also quenched my thirst to know language, Yorta Yorta. The result being a greater affinity with Yorta Yorta Waka deep appreciation of who I am, and now in a position to share and pass on my learnings and being able to say the following. Mumma Gaun in Yakaramja, Nya, Imago, Ninakani, Nyuandanganya. We are gathered here today, give love and respect to my elders past and present and my ancestors born of this country that lived and walked here on Yorta Yorta country since time immemorial. We remember them in our hearts. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy our home. Thanks. Thanks, Blynn. 
every time I hear that, you know, just really get a deep sense of pride and it's so good to hear that someone's keeping the language alive and there's some, some um, hope for our young people to learn language. So thanks, Blen. Thanks, Aunty Rochelle. Thanks, Uncle Graham and Jira. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Uncle Paul Briggs. Uncle Paul is a Yorta Yorta man who has worked for many years to build a sustainable, inclusive and engaged Indigenous community here in Shepparton and across the state through their empowerment of youth and their families. Uncle Paul is also Executive Director of the Kaila Institute and the inaugural president of this wonderful Rumblara Football and Netball Club. I would also like to introduce Uncle Paul's co-convener and friend, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Professor Glyn Davies. Davis. Glyn is the Professor of Political Science and the VC and Principal of the University of Melbourne. Professor Davis studied at the University of New South Wales and the Australian National University, as well as a Harkness Fellow at the University of California, the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C., and the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Please make them both feel welcome. Thanks, Saray. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm here to the 10th um, Dungala Kealo oration. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, journey and um, making a significant contribution to learnings and knowledge acquisition here in the Goulburn Murray and across the state. And hopefully it's spreading further than that. But um, I'd just like to reflect just a little bit on hearing you know, Belinda talk language and um, what it actually means. Um, you know, it talks to um, our ancestors and what's gone on before us, and it talks to what happened to our people. And it's the sounds of the revitalisation or the re-emergence of the language of our ancestors. And it was the language that our grandparents took, spoke, but it stopped for all sorts of reasons. And here we are at a very poignant time in our history where we've got the capacity for the re-emergence of the cultural expression and the identity of people. Um, so the Dungala Kealo oration and the partnerships that have brought, brought us together is built on that foundation of um, cultural respect, value, and the future of um, our people, but it's an integrated, intertwined future with Australian society as we know it. Um, I want to uh, just welcome you all to tonight and pay my respects to my ancestors and to my elders and to that wall of great people up there at the back that have um, made up who we are, um, to the Aboriginal people and elders that are in the room that have come from other places, um, to all peoples who have decided to be here to learn about the way forward. And I think that's a really fantastic um, opportunity for us. Um, I want to welcome Moana, Moana Jackson, a distinguished academic and Maori person who's come to share his experiences and his knowledge and his wisdom with us. It's that sort of sharing that will enable us to um, visualise the sorts of future we might, we might um, aspire to, um, given that we've um, now got a more formal process occurring in the negotiations and the development of, of a treaty process. What that actually determines in the future will become, will only be when all of you have the opportunity to participate in what it actually means. But it talks to the future of our people and it talks to the language revitalisation 
and it talks to the cultural expression of this country. Um, I also want to say um, welcome to Glyn. Um, this is the 10th oration, and if you've ha had a look at the booklets, um, the contribution by DKO has been immense, that we've been able to bring that contribution here into, into Shepparton, um, into the Goulburn Murray, onto Yorta Yorta country, and it's sparked the challenge that we thought needed to be sparked about how we move from an intervention deficit conversation into a progressive uh, investment and a rights model for in addressing the future of Indigenous peoples. Um, Glenn and the University of Melbourne have been partners with us for the last 14 years. Um, predominantly through the Academy of Sports Health and Education in its early days, which partnered with the Faculty of Medicine to talk about, through the Rumbelara Football Club, to talk about life expectancy and quality of life measurements. Um, I think we're moving into that space where treaty can actually de deliver um, the, the thinking that needs to be had around life expectancy and quality of life and the sorts of indicators that um, create a happy, vibrant, Aboriginal community integrated into the symbolisms of nationhood here in, in our region but across the country. Um, so I want to say, you know, this is going to be Glyn's last um, uh, oration as, as uh, the co-chair with me, um, but it's been a fantastic contribution from Glyn and uh, a fantastic contribution from the University of Melbourne, which has really positioned us to do more work, I think, with the University of Melbourne. So, fantastic. Um, also, um, I want to uh, welcome tonight Jill Gallagher, um, who has taken on a really significant role in the history of Victoria and the history of government and the history of our people. Um, in assuming the role of Treaty Commissioner here in Victoria. Um, that's, a, that's not an easy job to take that, take that on your shoulders, but um, in the process of um, looking for the appropriate person to lead the discussions in Victoria around Treaty, treaty um, Jill was um, presented herself through that through her history um, as, a, as a fighter for Aboriginal rights, as a fighter for community control, and as a fighter for the health of Aboriginal people here in, in, our, in our state, a Gunditjmara woman. Um, and we align ourselves with all of the peoples, Yorta Yorta peoples, Gunditjmara peoples. We align ourselves with the, with the First Nations people around here, but nationally. And, building these relationships that are international. Um, so welcome also to Jill tonight for, um, for being here and participating in this, these early steps around the platform of treaty. Um, also welcome to all of you and welcome to James Atkinson who's the, 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 new, uh, the CEO of the Rumbelara Aboriginal Cooperative, one of our major Aboriginal organisations that are here, um, so welcome, and welcome to other Aboriginal organisations that are present in the room, um, and to all dignitaries that, have, uh, that are present. Um, I, I just, the conversation we were having earlier with Glyn and Moana, talking about just where we're, where we're situated at, at tonight, you know, and I know we're in the, in the rooms of the Rumbelara Football Netball Club, and you know, this is, we're here through the goodwill of all of the young people that own this building and own this piece of land and own the Rumbelara Football Netball Club and we share this space with them. It's a very, it's a very honoured space to be in. It's a safe cultural space um, that shares in the, um, the uh, cultural expression of who we are in, in the city of Greater Shepparton. We're reconciling our place in the city of Shepparton in the city of Echuca, in the townships of Barmer, etc. 
it, it's no mean feat around mental health to be able to move from a dispossession process to the missions, to the edges of town and into the towns and to assume ownership of the infrastructure that dispossessed us. That's not an easy thing to do. But that's what we're reconciling as we, as we build these discussions about how we do that. Because it does talk to the future sustainability of our people, our future of building an economy that underpins us, about building a social economy that embraces us, but it talks about also our capacity to build symbolisms that is inclusive into the future. But, and there, there, but this is early times. We're moving out of an in, uh, a crisis intervention type of process into a progressive investment process. And the investment is in our own selves, around our cultural knowledge, our cultural expression, and our cultural affirmation. So this is really a fantastic time for us. Um, this year, reflecting on the year, maybe there's five or six of our elders, and I acknowledge Uncle Boydie is present with us tonight, who've turned 90. What a fantastic effort that's been. And we're looking forward to Uncle Boydie's 90th in uh, September, October. And on Saturday, Uncle Archie Walker had his 90th. Um, his, um, Auntie June's had hers. Auntie Elsie's had hers. Um, there's others that are aspiring to get to 90, like myself and others. Um, but it talks about the health of our mob. And I think that's, it's, it's right there beside and leads our mental health and our sense of aspiration and our sense of future. Um, there's some good things that were happening back 90 years ago, I think. Um, but it was a collective of Aboriginal people that was supportive of each other and I think that's a challenge for us at the moment, is to build infrastructure and build governance and build the sorts of things that keep us as a, as a collective, as a community. And I think we have to work a little bit on that. Um, pay my respects also to my wife Kay, who's travelled this journey with me um, for the last 40 years or so. Is it 40 or longer? Um, <laughs> or so. And. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, you know, that's been a fantastic journey as well. And again, it talks to stability. Um, it talks to stability of families when we've got high um, uh, removal of kids occurring in our, in our community, out of home care, on the upward trajectory that we've got to talk about how we, how we um, secure the, and, and support the structure of families. And, strong relationships and values invested in relationships and mums and dads, uncles and aunties, nans and pops and others supporting the structure of families. And uh, the Football Netball Club prides itself on supporting families and providing a space that social norms are strong um, and supportive of families, that kids are, are enjoying themselves, kids are happy, kids are contented, Kids are in school, they're in learning, they're in sport. It's a fantastic opportunity for us to address these things that are uh, prevalent in our community. And I'm talking to Moana about justice issues and the high incarceration rates of Aboriginal people, etc. They're all symptoms of a, of a real challenge that we've got. And the treaty conversation enables us to have these conversations about how do we get to the core root of the sorts of things that's going to um, drive us forward. Um, so there's lots of, um, lots of room, but tonight, you know, um, was just to listen to Moana, listen to his wisdom, um, and to reflect on that as to how we might take that on board in our conversations going forward. Um, so I'd like to just leave it at that and say um, welcome tonight. Hope you really enjoy the night. There's room for a few more, maybe. <laughs> um, so if you want to text anyone to come and join us, <laughs> there's some room up the back there. Um, so thanks very much.
Paul, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And I join you, of course, in paying respects to elders, not just past, but so many present. Uh, I particularly want to thank Paul. I've had um, 14 years of working with this extraordinary man and watching the way he has both mourned what is lost and worked so hard to bring his people back into the centre of this community. And it has been an extraordinary journey. And Paul, it's people like you that change the world and you've made such an extraordinary difference here. And I want to say thanks on behalf of the University of Melbourne because you made us part of this oration. I remember our first discussion about doing it and why it might make a difference. And you had this very clear vision that if we could invite prominent voices into the conversation, we could draw them into a discussion, we could make them part of the solution and we could make sure that we learned and shared. And you've shown through 10 remarkable years of this oration how that works. So thank you again. I remember the discussion about the very first orator and it, there's a lovely description of the very orations in the program for tonight. But um, inviting Carmen Lawrence was a really inspired idea. Um, the first woman to be a premier in Australia, of course, uh, and her speech on the prejudice of good people in 2009, uh, it really, I felt, was hearing a voice that wanted to address the limitations on Indigenous people through settler history and ask what are the responsibilities of those who've benefited from those limitations in giving back. It was a, a great speech. And then we've heard a series of people. Um, Paul was very keen that there be a strong business focus because business leaders needed to be part of this conversation. Uh, we had the West Farmers CEO, Richard Goida, in 2010. We had the then Chief Economist of the Bank of America, Saul Leslake, the following year. We had the Chief Executive of Westpac uh, in 2012. I don't know if he'd ever been to Shepparton before, but he came and he spent time here, and good on him, because he, he spent time in this community and Westpac got involved in the Kaler Institute. Uh, that was really worthwhile doing it. And then the following year, we had the Chair of KPMG, Peter Nash. So just a really nice set of things to do. In 2014, we moved venues, I'm sure you remember, to come here. And it was wonderful to come to Rumbalara Football and Netball Club and a very memorable first speaker in the new venue who was Noel Pearson from the Cape York Institute of Policy and Leadership. And he spoke to the big themes of, uh, of Aboriginal self-determination and reconciliation and constitutional recognition. And here we are in 2018 still having that discussion and we'll hear uh, from Moana tonight about that. But it hasn't just been business leaders. We've also had um, recently the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Martin Parkinson here. Martin, the most senior public servant in the country, again, speaking very profoundly to this question. And last year, we had the great joy of hearing from uh, the University of Melbourne's Associate Provost and the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor of Australian Studies, Marsha Langton spoke about her research and the data that she was generating about Indigenous outcomes, which was just extraordinary. We're very fortunate tonight to have such a distinguished international visitor in Dr Moana Jackson. And I've, as Paul said, I've just had the pleasure of chatting to him a little about his career and times, and, and he's made an extraordinary contribution, and we're going to hear a bit about it. And, and Paul is right, as always, again, that it's time to start thinking about what do we learn elsewhere? How do we bring that into the conversation here? How do we make that sort of difference? This oration series was designed as part of the reconciliation journey and a journey that involves, uh, for institutions like the University of Melbourne, uh, reconciliation action plans, which speak to every aspect of our work from teaching and learning through to employment, procurement and to research. And I mention research because I'm just delighted to note that tomorrow we're going to see the very first of the engaged-led research summits focusing on Indigenous prosperity here in the Goulburn Valley. So that's another outcome of this. Um, that summit will be hosted, co-hosted by Paul Briggs on behalf of the Kaler Institute and Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Sean Ewan on behalf of the University of Melbourne. It's another great collaboration. I think it shows what's possible. So on behalf of the university, thank you for the chance to be part of this journey. On my behalf, thank you, Paul, for your friendship over my time as Vice Chancellor, which I've hugely valued and enjoyed. Um, and finally, as Paul did, let me acknowledge the young people of the Rumbalara Club who provide us this venue, who make us welcome 
uh, and who will be the future, so whose engagement in this process is so uh, very important. I close by noting that I've never seen Paul Briggs so happy as I've seen him tonight because of the things that are going on, the treaty, the Manara Centre, the, the strength of this club and the strength of the community that's part of. It's a wonderful, wonderful way into this oration. So congratulations, Paul, and thank you all. Thank you. I think Uncle Paul's very happy because I think both the senior football and netball teams are in the top four. So, <laughs> Along with many other things, I think that's a major thing. Um, but <laughs> thanks, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for highlighting the, um, the past 10 years of orations and the orators um, and putting into context just um, how lucky we are and how fortunate we are to hear from Dr. Morna Jackson tonight because I'm sure that... Um, if he's following the trend of the last 10 years, then we're in for a treat. Um, so, and then I'd like to thank Uncle Paul um, just for mentioning that, you know, what this club and the community and the hub that the football club is for the community um, and how it's been built on the values of cultural respect and how we as a community in Shepparton, we look forward to sharing the wisdom in the negotiation of the treaty, of a treaty, sorry. Um, so I guess now that we're talking treaty, I'd like to introduce Sunny Jill Gallagher. Um, Ani Jill is a good, as Uncle Paul said, a Gundijamara woman. Ani Jill is a highly respected Aboriginal elder. She has spent a lot of her life advocating for the Aboriginal self-determination. And she spent 14 years as the CEO of the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. More recently, Ani Jill has been advocating for Victorian Aboriginal people as the co-chair of the Aboriginal Treaty Working Group um, and has been very instrumental throughout the Victorian journey to treaty. So make her feel welcome, thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on Aboriginal land, um, the land of the Yorta Yorta Nations, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present. I'd also like to pay my respects to any other elders in the room today, and thanks um, for that awesome welcome to country and hearing the Yorta Yorta language being spoken. Um, I agree, Paul, it's inspiring. Um, I want to thank Paul and Glenn for the invite um, to come and hear um, about what's happening in New Zealand. Um, looking forward to that. Um, I just want to... I got lost coming here. This is the second time I've been to the Rumbalara uh, Football Club. And I actually got lost. I ended up at that um, new complex down there, the sporting complex. But you know what I saw? And my Nat Sav wouldn't take me anywhere else. And I must have a bad Nat Sav. Um, but um, I saw the flag up here flying. It was like a beacon. Um, so I came back out on the main highway and found you. So thank God for that. <laughs> I was starting to stress out. Um, so, and thanks for the invite too. OK, Victoria, we all know that Victoria was uh, occupied prior to, prior to colonisation. Um, it's not a myth, it's a fact. Our ancestors walked this country when there was a land bridge between Tasmania and the mainland. <coughs> My ancestors witnessed volcanoes erupting. And we walked this country when there was megafauna. And they died out roughly about 45,000 years ago. Our communities survived the Ice Age. We survived the extinction of the megafauna. And we nurtured 
our lands and our country because it was a matter of survival. Because we needed our country to look after us and nurture us. We survived those natural disasters. But then something catastrophic happened. And that was colonisation or settlement or invasion. I keep forgetting to look over there. <laughs> Whatever language you like to use. We almost didn't survive that. Our people and our countries and our culture and our way of doing business took a beating. And our people that lived on missions, and Sp Paul spoke about the different phases of our lives that we've had to go through. And the mission era wasn't kind. It was illegal for our mums and our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers and our great-grandfathers to speak our language. It was a crime if you were caught. It was a crime to practice our laws, our way of doing business. But we did survive colonisation. We're still here today and we're a proud peoples. And I saw that earlier on when I got here really early and witnessed the work that Deborah's doing with the uh, young people and the choir and the singing. We're a very strong, proud peoples still today. But colonisation, it was brutal and it was quick and it had devastating impacts on our communities. And it still does today. And we're still trying to pick up those pieces and put back what was taken off us. And it's not easy. We still have a gap in our life expectancy. We still are overrepresented in the justice system. We have the worst statistics in the world with our children in out-of-home care. So we're still trying to put back the pieces of colonisation. We had the introduction of diseases, the massacres, the theft, the forced relocation of our peoples and, our, and generations of Aboriginal children. But despite all this, we still remain a strong and proud people. Our com communities continue to grow and make great strides. Over the last couple of weeks with NAIDOC, two weeks of NAIDOC, it was quite awesome, but it was quite exhausting too. Um, <laughs> I've been witnessing and seeing all the young people who were dancing and singing and telling stories and trying to live their culture. But I see a gap. And there is a gap in our generations. My mum never danced. She never had the opportunity to, co to learn her culture. She grew up on a mission. So therefore, she could not teach me how to dance or my stories or my laws or my way of doing business. So there is unfinished business in this country. Australia is the only developed Commonwealth country that does not have treaty 
with Indigenous people of this country. And we as Aboriginal Australians have never ceded our sovereignty. We never signed a treaty to say you can have our land. The, first, the only treaty that was ever signed in this country was in 1835, and that was the John Batman Treaty. Not Batman, Batman. <laughs> and that treaty was with the local Kulin clan elders. And they signed it, but they thought that they were signing permission to enter their country, not to sell 160,000 acres of prime real estate, I might add, for a few blankets and some trinkets. But luckily, that treaty was null and void two months later. It was never enacted because it was a real bad deal, and thank God for that. But what the treaty did say, but what it did say, was that even back as early as 1835, the authorities then, or the government or the authorities, whatever they were called back then, recognised that terra nullius was a myth, that this country was occupied, by a sovereign people and we didn't need the High Court in the Mabo case to overturn Terra Nullius. Tonight is an opportunity to contrast our experience with New Zealand. Like Australia, New Zealand was violently colonised. Europeans in their pursuit to rip resources from the land, displace people, and also impact on the Māori cultures and culture. But however, back in 1840, the Crown entered into a treaty with the Māori chiefs. This treaty offered a rec offered recognition of Māori rights and sovereignty. And that was never afforded to us as the first people of this country. Whilst recognising there were differences in the historical context, including the unique, including a unique distrust of the French, of French settlement, I wonder why this basic extension of humanity that was afforded to other Indigenous people around the world and ignored in Australia. I don't think it's because we were any less fierce in resisting colonisation, because we did. And I certainly don't think it was because our culture and the way of life was any less valuable. And I'm looking forward to Dr Jackson's address this evening. So treaty in Victoria, so we're, so we're nearly 180 years overdue I'm not sure whether we're catching up, but we're, uh, we're getting there. The call for treaty isn't new in Australia. We've had our warriors in the past, we've had our champions, who have often called and demanded for treaties. But what is new, the Victorian government has heeded this call and has put treaty on the table. My role isn't to negotiate treaties. My role is to set up a statewide body so that we can go down the pathway of treaties. The government need to know who do they talk to. Not who do they negotiate with, we're not there yet. 
Who do they talk to to work out the treaty framework? The ro rule book, the roadmap, how are we going to get to treaties? So my role is to establish this representative body, this statewide body, and their role will be to negotiate with the state government about that treaties negotiating framework. My role is to set up elections for this statewide body. Because there will, it will be a democratic process. There'll be approximately 30 people, or traditional owners, or traditional owners from country within the state of Victoria. Because it, if we're successful, it's a treaty with the state government, not the Commonwealth. So we need to make sure that we elect our best hunter-gatherers because their negotiation, their role, is to set up how we're going to negotiate treaties. Is it going to be one treaty? Is it going to be clan-based treaties? Therefore, multiple treaties. What's on the table? What's off the table? What's within a state government remit? And what's the time frame for that? That's what this statewide body is to work out. All those unanswered questions. So in Victoria, we are further down the road to treaty than we have ever been before in this country anywhere. We actually have a piece of legislation that got passed through the lower house and the upper house. It is now an act of parliament. The first legislation in this country that commits a government to talk to this statewide body, that commits the statewide body to set up a treaty authority, that commits the statewide body to ensure that the government sets up a self-determination fund and what that's going to look like. That's what that legislation does. First ever. But we still have a long way to go and there are challenges. It's not an easy road, as Paul would know. For the past two years, we've had Aboriginal people from across the state of Victoria, all traditional owners in their own right, who have helped us work out how do we go down this road? How do we begin the conversations? How do we begin setting up this framework? Two years of hard work by volunteers who have got us where we are today. And I think I've used up my five minutes, so I better, I better close. <laughs> Again, Paul, thank you for the opportunity to come and listen. Um, and um, we, are at, we are at such a critical point in our history and in our struggle for the rights and the recognition of our people as fundamental sovereign people. I ask all Victorians both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, to get behind the process, to stay informed and keep these conversations going. We've got to at least get to the negotiating table. Thank you. Thanks, Sunny Jill, and thanks for clarifying because I think, you know, there is a lot of um, talk and questions around what's going on with treaty and um, I apologise for saying that you're negotiating these That's talks. Okay. It's, it, is, it is very good to hear that there will be a representative body so that enables everyone to be part of those negotiations. So thank you. And I didn't notice that five minutes, so <laughs> thanks. Um, and just while we're on that, could I please ask that everyone turns their phones um, off or onto silent? Um
because it is really hard when you're up here talking and you hear a phone go off. Um, so um, next, it, it's my pleasure to um, introduce the famous, the very famous Dungala Children's Choir, who's led by the very, very famous, <laughs> internationally renowned Yorta Yorta soprano, Deborah Cheatham. Deborah and the choir are doing incredible work in revitalising the Yorta Yorta language through song and storytelling. And I guess they, they share and they connect with all people, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, all ages, through the way that they sing and the way that I love the black and red and just the way that the kids are engaged. Thanks, Deb. We have sound. Uh, I've never been so proud to be a Yorta Yorta woman as I am right now. In this age of uh, seeing us reap the benefits of the leadership that's been on this country for, well, m well over 50,000 years, but in living memory, all of those people that are about to turn 90 this year, Uncle Boydy, there's going to be some party, I know. If I know anything about you, I know that it will be some celebration. So loved that you are. We are reaping the benefits that, uh, that those 90-year-olds, they, they planted that in the ground for us to harvest at this time and that work has been continuous. And Jill, what those five minutes flew. I would have liked another five, maybe another ten, and I hope over dinner we'll get to talk. And I'm so glad your sat nav got you here. <laughs> I'm so glad that you mentioned about the resistance, the resistance that was made in those early days, the resistance still that we have put up to say, hey, you know what? You know what would get us there quicker? If you did things our way. Okay, if you did things our way, if you learned from the most resilient culture on the planet, uh, with a close second to uh, our neighbours across the ditch, of course, but the most resilient uh, culture on the face of the planet, the longest continuing culture, uh, we were doing something right in all those 70, 80,000 years. And the way that we passed on all that knowledge was, of course, through song. This choir in front of you today is uh, probably almost going into the third generation of uh, Dangala Children's Choir in a way. Next year we'll celebrate our 10th anniversary. I think this is, I was counting, either the 7th or the 8th Dangala Kayala oration that uh, some form of the choir has sung in. You'll see some of the pictures up scrolling through. We always begin with this song, Bura Fera, uh, because of the leadership at a time when our language was suppressed, uh, we were able to retain this song. I know that there are some former members of Dangala Children's Choir here tonight, so if you'd like to come and join us to sing Bura Fera Shanoa, um, <clears throat> come on up, come on. I'm going to get everybody to sing it. Thanks, Tony.
you, Chanel. We really value the mentors and the former members of the choir who were there at the very, very beginnings. And I hope that you'll come along to our 10 year celebrations next year, Chanel. We'd love to have you there. Uh, this choir has travelled uh, to many destinations around the country. And later this year, Jill, we're going to be down on your beautiful volcanic uh, Gunditjmara country to sing a work that Vicky Cousins has helped, uh, has helped me to create, which really is in honour of all of those who fell in those wars of resistance in the 1800s. And down there on Gunditjmara land, that war of resistance became known as the Umarella War. Uh, in every other theatre of war that Australians have ever fought in, uh, there has been a declaration of peace, a peace treaty. No such treaty exists in Australia. In fact, the knowledge around the resistance wars is very little. And so, Umarella, a war requiem for peace, will be sung on country on the 14th of October. And, and these children, some kids from Gunditjmara country, and uh, some children from our Dangala Choral, uh, our Dangala Children's Choir in Geelong will join together uh, to perform alongside the Consort of Melbourne and uh, an ensemble of musicians of the very finest calibre. This will be sung entirely in Gunditjmara language. It's some 70 minutes of music and these children are in the process of learning your language. We were not going to sing this song on the program but I just I have to put it in, Tony. I'd like to put in... Um, a song which uh, particularly welcomes you. The very first word that I ever learned in your beautiful language was Ndat Noir. And uh, this is a song uh, that we wrote many years ago. It's called Our Song and it sums up the philosophy of Dangala Children's Choir. That a song is not just a song. Uh, why do we study anything? Why do we study medicine to heal ourselves and to live longer? Why? so that we can know ourselves and this world. And how do we know ourselves and this world? Through the arts. Just a few short weeks ago, we published our first book of songs and uh, it's here. It's here tonight. We even brought a few copies along with us. If you'd like to purchase one later, just come and see Tony at the piano. It's called the Dangala Choral Connection Songbook. It represents five years of work. Uh, Tony, myself and Jess, who's not here tonight actually, she's over in Canada uh, performing with Mission Songs. And we've travelled this country for five years, working with children everywhere, the most extraordinary, beautiful, talented children. And we're 
we've been able to learn some of the language starting with sometimes only just one word, but such an important word. Uh, we have included it in this book. The first, uh, the first music that I wrote entirely in Yorta Yorta language was the prelude for um, Pecan Summer, which we won't be singing this evening. But the second song was Galnya Ninak, which with the help of Ani uh, Zita Thompson Briggs and with the help of Belinda Briggs, who spoke so beautifully at the welcome this evening, we've been able to not only sing this song and put it into the book with beautiful art by Yorta Yorta artist Lynn Thorpe, but we've also made a CD, which we also have this evening, a live recording of the concert which launched the book in Melbourne just a few weeks ago. Galnya Ninak. Where are all my people? They're on this beautiful country. My people are here. I mentioned one of the features of the uh, Dangala Coral Connection songbook and this beautiful artwork on the cover is by one of our parents from the Geelong Choir, the Wadawarang country. Uh, Lynn, I know you're here, I'm going to show your work. Uh, it's right there at the top. Throughout the entire book, we commissioned art for this book from people living on the country uh, where each of the songs comes from. And that is because uh, the arts were never siloed as they are now in, uh, in practice. The dancer was often the singer and the singer was the painter and the painter was the storyteller. And so that way of the arts being integrated in practice is also important is also important if we want Aboriginal people to take their rightful place all across this nation we need to understand that integrated approach is so important. Uh, but there is work to do yet and uh, Dr Jackson I know you're going to address this and I'm very much looking forward to your address too because I know the impact that uh, journeying to Aotearoa for the very first time about 20 years ago had the impact on me to see Māori people everywhere in every walk of life and holding office and, uh, you know, serving you on the plane, behind the counter in the bank, everywhere. Something that I hadn't seen as an Aboriginal woman in my time 20 years ago. That is changing. But I've promised Dungala Children's Choir that we will always sing this next song, Do You Know Me? And we will particularly always sing it while it's just still so necessary in this country. It's the first song that I wrote for the choir and uh, it really speaks to the heart of what I mentioned before, 
that we need to have a reciprocal understanding of one another in this country. It's not simply a question of Aboriginal people getting up to speed on non-Aboriginal ways of doing things. It's absolutely imperative that Australia recognises that 70,000 years of culture is worth something. In fact, it was worth a great deal. In fact, it sets us apart in the entire world. And so we ask non-Aboriginal Australia, we know you, but do you know us? Finally, a song that is only possible because of the work that Belinda has been doing. Belinda, I know that you'd want to say that you're standing on the shoulders of those elders who held that language and they buried it deep. And I know, I know that we've made a contribution to changing the way we speak about that. Fewer people now are saying, oh, the languages were lost. They were not lost. We would not be that careless. Those languages are buried deep. Deep in, deep in the ground, deep in our hearts for safekeeping, for the safety of our children. And now that they're being revitalised, we, we need people like Belinda to come along to a little workshop that Tony and Jess and I ran so that we could write this beautiful song, Biramamana. It means heading back to the nest. Some of these children will be heading home to do their homework, uh, do it, give a driving lesson. Probably I heard somebody, that's scaring me. Um, <laughs> Uh, and later on this evening, we'll all be heading home to the nest and we'll be remembering the words that these beautiful children have sung. And I hope that you will come to hear them sing in Port Ferry if you can make it on the 14th of October. If you can't, then um, I hope you will take home a copy of the book or at least put an order on one for one. We're very, very proud to be here on Yorta Yorta Country, the country of my grandmother, Sissy McGee. Thank you.
Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Tony, and thanks to the Dungala Children's Choir. Um, thanks for, I, I especially love Burafera. I remember living in Marupna growing up and going to the little white Church of Christ with Nanny Bay, my great great grandmother. Um, and here, and you know, that's a lot of elders, Auntie Nancy and Nanny Bay singing. Um, I dare say they were opera singers too <laughs> um, in the church over there. So thank you so much. And it's, you know, when hearing Uncle Paul and Auntie Jill telling the story of, you know, the atrocities that our people have faced and um, to see that we do still have language and we very much are still here, um, you know, it gives me hope, it really does. And I think, um, you know, it does engender hope for all of our young people. So thank you. Thanks. And next up, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Morna Jackson. Morna is of Nati Kahunungu, Ro Ngumai Wahine, and Nati Puro descent. <laughs> is from the east coast of Aotearoa. Warner is a highly regarded lawyer who spent time studying at the Victorian University in Wellington and Columbia University in New York. Warner is highly regarded throughout Māori Dom and mainstream Aotearoa for the important contribution he has and continues to make to the struggles of the Māori people in terms of the Treaty of Waitangi. Warner has recently co-chaired a working group on constitutional transformation that was responsible for developing a new constitution based on the Treaty of Waitangi. Please welcome the 10th annual Dungala Kaili Orator, Dr. Morna Jackson. Thank you for the kind welcome to your country. I too would like to acknowledge and honour the traditional landowners, and if I may, I'd like to do so in my own language. Kia koutou te hau kainga, te mana whenua, a nei tenei tetahi manuhiri ko tai mai i wanganui a koutou i te pōnei. Mihi mai, mihi mai, karanga mai. Kia kaha, kia toa, kia manawa nui, ia koutou moi moia, moa tātou mokapuna tamariki. Nō reira huri noa tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou. It is really an, an honour and a privilege for me to come to this place for the first time and an especial honour to be asked to give this oration Although when I did first get the invitation, I accepted it under a misapprehension. Um, I heard it was being held at a football and netball club. Being from home, I assumed it was a rugby club. <laughs> and my, my father was an All Black. He played rugby for New Zealand. And I was looking forward to telling my family how I was going to speak at an Aboriginal rugby club. <laughs> and I realised the state of Victoria, no, it probably wasn't rugby. <laughs> but it is a, a delight to be here, and particularly in this club, to see the story that's told on the back wall, the people who are honoured there, the contributions which they have made. And particularly I'd like at this point to acknowledge Paul and Glyn for the collaboration and partnership which they have shared over the last number of years and to just say kia ora or greetings to you all. I would also like to acknowledge someone from home sitting in the front row who 
it was a pleasant surprise to see here tonight Tenakwe Ruth. But besides accepting the invitation under a misapprehension, I also accepted it with some embarrassment because I was asked if I had a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and most speakers now have PowerPoints. Um, I'm technologically illiterate. Um, I still struggle to work my cell phone. And PowerPoints are often beyond me, and I really became aware of how technologically backward I was just a few weeks ago when I was working, I thought, rather impressively on my laptop. And one of my mukapuna, one of my granddaughters, was sitting beside me and looking rather quizzically at me, and she said, you don't do much on your laptop, do you? <laughs> and I said, oh, my baby, a laptop is really just a flash typewriter. And she looked at me and said, what's a typewriter? <laughs> and I really, really felt my age. The second difficulty when I was asked was I'd ask, I was asked to send a transcript of my speech. Um, but I wasn't embarrassed in responding to that because I, I don't have a written speech. And I'd like to explain why, and then that might make some sense of what I wish to say and share with you this evening. When I was three years old, my kuro, my mother's father, came to live with us. And he was a wonderful storyteller and a proud holder of our language and our history and our oral traditions. And some of my fondest memories as a child were when he would wake me in the morning and say, I've spoken to your mother, you don't need to go to school today, you can come with me. And I was out of bed faster than I ever was on a school day. And we would go to a meeting somewhere about land or about the ongoing struggles of our people. And on the way there and on the way back, he would tell me stories. And I grew to love those stories and to call them the stories in the land. Because every rock, every river, every mountain, as it is in your country, has a name and a story. And those stories are still there in spite of all that has happened, waiting for us to hear them if we care to take the time to listen. And so what I'd like to do tonight is tell some stories. And what I learned from my grandfather about stories is that you can often take the most complicated subject and by telling a story you can draw out threads of understanding that make that complex subject understandable and sensible to those who perhaps are hearing it for the first time. Mm. And so the first story I'd like to tell which sort of frames what I'd like to talk about this evening is one that I'm going to tell in two parts. The first part now, and I'll come back to the second part of the story near the end of my time with you. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter who is the most beautiful granddaughter in the world, of course. And her first language was our language, the first language she learned to speak, to read and, and to write was Māori. And then she began to learn English because it's all around her. And we were sitting on the couch one day and she had a book that had a list of English words. And she was reading out the words. 
and sometimes she would ask me what they meant. Then at one point she paused for quite a while and then she said to me, Kuro, what's this word? And she spelt it to me, F-U-T-U-R-E. I said, that's future. And she said, what's a future? Do you know how hard it is to explain to an eight-year-old what a future is? But I did my best and I told a story and then I said, so the future is when we take all the times of our past, bring them into today, and then we carry them into all of our tomorrows. And that carrying into all of our tomorrows is future. And she seemed satisfied with that and carried on going through her word list. And the next morning, I was sitting in the kitchen quite early and she came bustling in, got out the little lunchbox that she takes to school, started putting some food in it, filled up a water bottle, then bustled outside and stuffed them into the saddlebag on her little bike. And while she was doing that, the little Parkour boy, the little white boy from next door, who's two years younger than her, and my family call him her shadow because he follows her everywhere. He came through the fence and he said, what are you doing? And with that wonderful non-response which children have and which politicians never lose, she said, nothing. <laughs> and then she got on her bike and started to pedal up the drive. And he said, where are you going? And she said, to look for a future. And he said, can I come? <laughs> and she looked over her shoulder and said, can you keep up? <laughs> the challenge that I think that faces all countries that have been colonised is that Indigenous peoples are forging a journey and asking the others in that country Will you come with us? Can you keep up? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that journey. In 1923, a small group of Māori people travelled to Geneva in Switzerland because after years of breaches of our treaty by the government, after years of fruitless journeys to England to meet the king or the queen with whom the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, frustrating journeys which cost a lot of time and money for our people and brought no positive response, they heard of this place that had been established in Geneva after the First World War called the League of Nations. And so this group of our leaders said, perhaps we should go to this new place. Perhaps we should go to this League of Nations, <coughs> governments from around the world, and see if they will listen to our stories. So they traveled by boat to England then across the channel and then by train across France to Switzerland. It took them four months. And when they arrived at this grand, what was then new building called the Palais des Nations, the Palace of Nations, which was the headquarters of the League of Nations, they were not allowed to enter because a representative of the New Zealand government had said, the League of Nations is a place for nations. These people are not nations. And so our old people turned around and made the long journey home. One of the members of that delegation was an elder of our people 
And when he got back, he reported that the halls of that palace are not yet ready to hear our stories. The walls of that palace are not yet ready to hear our voice. Fifty years later, almost to the day, that grand palace in Geneva, by 1973, was occupied by part of a new organisation that had replaced the League of Nations after the Second World War. And that new organisation was called the United Nations and the Human Rights Division of the United Nations occupied the Palais de Nation in Geneva. And a group of indigenous peoples, mainly from North and South America, travelled to Geneva for the same reason that our ancestors had gone there 50 years earlier, to see if that was a place where they could tell their stories, air their grievances, and perhaps have some redress. But they too were refused admission, and for the same reason. So they returned home, but came back the following year, and came back the year after that, and the year after that, until finally a small group of states, mainly the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, said we can't keep refusing to listen to these people. And so an organisation was established called the Working Group on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it was the first international place where Indigenous peoples could go to tell their stories. But more importantly, perhaps, it was a place where Indigenous peoples decided that they would draft a declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples. It was, in a sense, a place where people at home on country could become at home in the world. And I was asked to go as part of the first Māori delegation to the United Nations and subsequently was asked to chair the Indigenous Caucus in the 20 long years that it took to negotiate the Declaration. And there are a number of lessons which I took from that, which I think are still relevant for Indigenous peoples today. The first is that all of the indigenous peoples who came to Geneva each year for the meetings that were drafting the declaration, and many came from Australia and from countries all around the world, had stories of dispossession, of violence, of the genocide, of colonisation. And those stories were often shocking and sad to hear. But I always found that in those stories there was actually also a noble beauty. The nobility of survival, the nobility of resistance, and the beauty of people who would never let their stories and their lands die. And it was from those stories in their lands that we began to articulate the rights in the Declaration. And the reason why Indigenous peoples wanted to do that was because one of the things that colonisation does is it denies the humanity of Indigenous peoples. It declared, whether in Australia or New Zealand or Canada or Kenya, it declared that indigenous peoples were less than human. And so to articulate for the first time 
a declaration on the human rights of indigenous peoples was a very public and international attempt to reclaim the humanity which had for too long been denied to us. And when I was asked to chair the Indigenous Caucus, it became one of the most challenging but also one of the most inspiring periods in my life. And I remember it mainly for two reasons. The first was that although we were all different, spoke different languages, had different cultures and customs, there were also profound similarities. That no matter where the indigenous peoples came from, they came, as I said, with their own stories and their land. They came with a love of that land. They came with an understanding that in spite of all that had happened, they had survived. But most importantly, perhaps firstly, they came with the knowledge that although their people had to adapt to survive the terrors of colonization, that adaptation never meant submission. That adaptation never meant giving up the integrity and the independence of who they were. The second thing which I learned when chairing the caucus was that part of that love of a land, part of that being with the land, gave each indigenous peoples a unique understanding of the land in which their people had made their homes. And that then brought to the whole discussion about the rights which indigenous peoples could have a deep sense of place. And that if anything marks out the difference for me between indigenous peoples and those who invaded or came to their lands, it is that the rights which indigenous peoples have come from place. They are not imported from somewhere else. They are not defined by a parliament or a legislation, but come from being of place. And what I've learned here in the short time I've been on this country is what I've learned every time I've been to other places in Australia that the Aboriginal peoples here are no different, that their rights come from place, and that place infuses the very humanity which has for so long been denied. And the article in the Declaration, which perhaps most profoundly gives expression to that idea of place, of our inherent humanity, is what in the sometimes cold jargon of international law is called the right of self-determination. And I know that right off by heart. In the Declaration it says very simply, all indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. In those two short sentences, it seems to me, is summed up in the world the essence of what being indigenous is on country that we have a right to determine for ourselves our own destiny. And that although recent history may have denied us that right and that ability, it still vests in the land and it still vests in us. 
And so for me, the importance of indigenous peoples being at home on country and being at home in the world is that the humanity which has been denied will one day again be expressed to the world. <coughs> and that leads me to where indigenous peoples are today. And allowing for all the differences, I think there are some common threads which run through the struggle, the victories, the often bitter defeats, but most of all, the joyous survival of indigenous peoples. Is the fact that once you are people of a land, once you have through time establish that you are part of the land, then you live and breathe that land, which in return not just gives you life, but defines who you are and defines your rights. And in 1840, when people from somewhere else came to our land, we thought it was important to treat with them because making treaties was a part of our long history of dealing with each other. And the term at home that we use in our language for treaty making is mahi tuhono, which means to bring people together. And it seems to me that's a nice way of describing what a treaty is. It's a means of bringing people together. And so in 1840, and leading up to the beginning of the signing of the treaty, there were meetings held by our people all around the country about whether in fact we should have a treaty with these newcomers, and if we did, what might it say? Some of our people said, yes, we need to. Many of our people said, why should we? This is our place. We don't need to treat with newcomers. And so not all of the iwi or representative bodies of our people agreed to treat with this new entity that was called the Crown. But one of the iwi which I belong to, Ngāti Kahumanu, we decided to sign because we sensed that lots of people would keep coming and that unless we set some framework of bringing people together, then there would be no guarantee that we would be safe that we would be protected. And in our little part of the iwi, where I grew up, the person who led us at the time and had the mandate to sign or to negotiate a treaty was a woman whose name was Hineaka. And so when our people made the decision that they would treat with this thing called the crown. It was Hineaka who was to do that on our behalf. And so when the meeting was held with the British government officials, and then the request was made for those who wished to sign to step forward, and she stepped forward. And the British officials then said, oh, we, we have a problem. Women can't sign treaties. <laughs> Which in their law at the time was absolutely right. In their law at the time, women couldn't sign contracts, couldn't own property, couldn't make a will, and certainly couldn't sign treaties. 
And I'm sure that our people must have thought that was rather odd because we knew the treaty was actually with a woman in England <laughs> called Queen Victoria, yet ours weren't allowed to sign. And our little group then had a really important choice to make. To either find a man who could sign on our behalf, or to say, if this woman, who is our leader, who has our authority, cannot sign, then we will go home. And to my everlasting pride, they chose the second option. And they didn't sign, and they walked the 30 miles home. And so that ancestor for me is one of the many heroes that I have. My mother carried her name, Haneaka. My youngest granddaughter carries her name, Haneaka. But the fact that we did not sign the treaty for that reason did not mean that we did not want a relationship with these new people. And the word treaty, did any of you study Latin at school? Oh, there, I thought there was a bit of class down here. <laughs> I asked some young people that today and they all look blankly. Um, I had to do Latin when I went to high school and then at law school, when I was at law school, Latin was compulsory for the first year. So I studied Latin for five, six years and I never learned much except that I can work out where a lot of English words come from. And the word treaty comes from the Latin tractare, which means to seek a relationship, which sounds a lot like mahi tūhono, bringing people together. And so although we did not sign the Treaty of Waitangi, we always wanted and sought a relationship with these newcomers. But the relationship was always based on an understanding that we would remain an independent and self-determining people. And sadly, the long history at home since 1840 has been a constant struggle by our people to maintain that self-determining ability to define what we feel is best for us. And so when I heard that in Canada and in Australia there was discussion about a treaty process. I was quite excited because the treaty does offer a chance to make relationships. But the relationships must be based on an acceptance of the sovereignty, of the right of self-determination of the parties involved. And a treaty perhaps requires more than anything else a particular recognition of the status and place of the indigenous peoples who are treating. Because treaties by their nature are internation or international agreements. They cannot be signed by individuals they can only be signed by individuals on behalf of a nation. And so I think one of the challenges that faces Indigenous peoples in Canada, and the challenge, and I think it's an exciting challenge, which will lie before you and which I'm sure you are all aware of, is to ensure that your nationhood, your ability to be self-determining is protected and is the base upon which a new relationship can be forged. And in forging that new relationship, I think there are three other things 
which are important. And they go back in a sense to the answer I gave to my granddaughter when she asked, what is the future? The first is that if we are to have a meaningful relationship with those who came to our lands as invaders, as settlers, as people who wanted to find a new home, then I think it's important that we never forget the past. That the tragedies, the violence, the sadness of the past should be remembered not as a call to guilt or even necessarily a call for perpetual sadness, but as a spur to remedy, that the, the past becomes the catalyst for change. Because if we forget the past, it seems to me, it's not so much that we are then condemned to repeat it out of ignorance. Rather, if we forget the past, then we forget the base on which we should be building a new relationship. We forget to acknowledge those who went before us, who stayed strong, who resisted, who exhibited what I called before that noble beauty of resilience and struggle. The second thing that I think is important is that we shape the treaty to suit the present. One of the things that colonisation does is it tends to freeze us at the time when the colonisers arrived. It grants to the colonisers a right to develop, to adapt and to change, but freezes indigenous peoples at the time of contact almost, in its most extreme form, continues to define indigenous peoples as somehow inferior, or acknowledges sometimes with genuine respect, often with a sort of bemused tolerance, that all that indigenous peoples have to offer is song and dance and culture. But as I said before, adaptation has never meant submission. And so a treaty process must acknowledge where the indigenous peoples are today the different lives we lead, the struggles we still have to wage for respect and for honour, but acknowledge that we are not the same as our ancestors were 200 years ago. We have the same love of land, we have the same deep-seated values, but we are part of a different world. And the third thing that I think is important in any discussion of treaties is that it has to plan for the future. That it must take the past, bring it to today, so that our grandchildren may carry it into the future. So any contemporary treaty must, in my view, be future-proofed. It must be so strong that it preserves the self-determination self of indigenous peoples, flexible enough to offer those who came later a place in our land, but visionary enough to imagine a different future. And those three things, I think, are the biggest challenge of a contemporary treaty process. But Indigenous peoples have never shirked from challenge. And when we first assembled in Geneva to talk about a declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, there was this huge, round, 
circular assembly filled with state governments. And my first thought when I walked in was, oh man, at, at home it's hard enough to deal with one government. <laughs> Here we're going to have to deal with 162. But the challenge was picked up by Indigenous peoples because the vision, the history and the today was all there. And that was illustrated for me perhaps most vividly in 1992, which was 500 years since Christopher Columbus stumbled into the Caribbean. And so the indigenous delegates from North and South America, and there were hundreds there that year, approached me as chair and said, can we have a minute's silence before we start tomorrow? Just to acknowledge the death and suffering of all the ancestors over those last 500 years. And because of the protocols of the United Nations, I then had to go to the chair of the state caucus and check if that was all right. She said, I'll have to go and talk to the states. <laughs> and she came back about two hours later and said, uh, you can't have a minute silence. The United Nations is not a place for ceremony. If you want a ceremony, you can go outside under the trees. Well, I had to deliver that message back to nearly 2,000 Indigenous delegates. And I knew what their reaction would be. And they said, we should just do it anyway. <laughs> when the assembly convenes tomorrow, we should just walk in and have a minute silence before we sit down. And so we agreed. And then our delegation was approached, again mainly by the North and South American indigenous peoples, many of whom have a notion of clan mothers, where all the key decisions are made by women. And we had with us two of our aunties, or as we call them, two of our fire. And they were the oldest women there and so these North and South American delegations asked them if they would be the clan mothers and lead us in the next morning, which was a wonderful honour to our people. So the next morning we assembled and the states were already seated in the assembly and the idea was that we would file around this half circle assembly and stand and have a minute silence. And so our two aunties took us in and began to call what we call the karanga, which is a ceremonial call to our ancestors, to the people of that place and so on. And as they were calling the people filed around the side. And I thought that when the karanga, when the call was finished, we would all have our minute silence. But while the call was taking place, I noticed the first delegation, which were people from the Aztec nation in Mexico, were in a huddle having an animated discussion. And when the karanga finished, the leader of the Aztec delegation stepped forward and sang this long and very old Aztec chant. Then the next delegation were, I think, from the Mapuche people in Chile. And their leader stepped forward and led a very old and long <laughs> Mapuche prayer. And that went right around <laughs> all of the delegations. So instead of a minute silence, <laughs> we had a three hour cultural celebration. <laughs> and
And when it was over, I, I said to her, that, that was just really so amazing, wasn't it? And she said, and she was one of those generation of our people who spoke beautiful Māori and spoke English like she was the Queen of England. And when I said, that was just amazing, why she turned to me and you said, my dear, self-determination takes many forms. <laughs> and indeed it does. And so if you embark on this treaty process, how you express your self-determination is for you alone to determine. And you may do it differently to us, and we may do it differently to Native American peoples and so on. But that difference doesn't matter. What matters is that we do it for ourselves. And as we do that, can I just close with the second part of my granddaughter's story? Because when she pedaled off on her bike that morning to look for a future, with her little Parker mate running behind her, <laughs> trying to keep up. And she was away for quite a while. And when she came back finally, and I said to her, oh, where have you been? She says, oh, I went, I went to look for a future. And I said, did you find it? And she said, well, no, it was in front of me all the time. <laughs> And I rode past the school, and I rode past the football ground, a rugby ground. I rode past the rugby ground, but it was always there, past the trees, past the mountain. And I said, well, that's what a future is. It takes us with us. And she put her lunchbox away and said, well, I think I'll just go and dream what a future might be. And that perhaps is our greatest challenge. That we do not get constrained by what a government says a treaty relationship might be. We do not get limited by what others tell us the future might be. We do not get hamstrung by a notion of what people say is realistic or unrealistic. But we dare to dream. We dare to imagine something different because the future in the end will be whatever we imagine it to be. And if we imagine it to be a better place for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, if we imagine it to be a place where everyone on our country feels at home then the question to everyone else on our country is indeed, can you keep up? Are you prepared to share this dream? So in whatever lies ahead of you on this country, I wish you well. Thank you so much again for inviting me to share some time with you. It has been an honour and a privilege and I hope one day I may return. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you very much. That was so moving and um, I guess so challenging, setting up, um, setting us all up for a challenge. And um, I'm not going to say too much because um, I next want to invite James Atkinson to respond with some closing remarks to Mourner's beautiful oration. Um, James has recently returned home. I don't know if he heard the Dungala Children's Choir sing that song, singing him home. Um, but he's taken on the challenge of um, becoming the CEO of the Rumblar Aboriginal Cooperative. So please welcome James to give the closing remarks. I just want to say thanks Uncle Paul and for um, giving me the opportunity, it's really great. Um, certainly for me, before I begin I'd like to acknowledge um, one that I'm home and it's really great to be home. 
Um, two, that I stand um, proud to be the CEO of Rumble Aboriginal Cooperative. Um, it was good to come back home. I'm, I want to acknowledge a, a special lady who um, continuously and tirelessly uh, was always at me to come home and only this year um, she passed away, which is my mother, Patricia Atkinson, um, who was always on for me to come home. So, Mum, I've come home. Three months too late, but I've come home. Um, I certainly want to acknowledge the traditional lands, um, and when I do this, I certainly want to acknowledge and know that I feel proud that I'm in a room of esteemed elders, um, elders that I've gr grown up around. Um, most of them. I certainly have learned a lot from, um, so I certainly want to acknowledge him. Um, before I do, I, I think there's probably something I want to actually say, that I grew up around a lot of elders and it was about families of families. Um, and for me to come back home, one of the things that's really important for me um, is to acknowledge the Yura Yura people, but also to acknowledge the other clans and certainly the Bangarang people in that. Um, but I'm proud to acknowledge my Yura Yura elders, um, who have been inspirational, and certainly um, Uncle Paul and Uncle Boydie and other elders in this room um, have certainly helped uh, lead me and inspire me, certainly in terms of my uh, grandmother and grandfather, uh, who would not let me live it down to always make sure I was at schooling and doing schooling. So I just want to do that. My reflections to um, how do you follow um, four amazing speakers, but certainly in especially um, Dr. Morna, um, an amazing speech. Um, but I'll do my best to try and capture um, certainly s some of uh, Dr. Morna's speech. Um, in doing that, though, let me first uh, capture a little bit of what Uncle Paul said. Because um, I think it's important that we acknowledge the journey. And Uncle Paul spoke a lot about our ancestors, about um, what happens to our people, that we need to be strong in our, our cultural expressions. We need to look at um, what, what it means for our future. The strength of our journey is defined by our history. Um, and you know, these are things that most people who know Uncle Paul know that's what he talks about, but you know, he leads it as well as he talks it. So, um, you know, it's certainly always been inspirational. Um, Professor Glynn talked about the strength of partnership between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, um, and certainly reconciliation, but I think probably one of the big things is it just says um, that, you know, people should have always been walking with Aboriginal people, but I certainly would acknowledge that the 10 years of that. Before I um, jump into the next one, um, I do want to touch on the choir. Um, it is very inspirational to know that our future is in our young ones and to hear their voices. Um, yeah, I think Deborah's right, our culture is never lost. Um, and to hear the, the beautiful uh, voices of the angels that sung up here was amazing. And I can't, um, can't be more proud of um, the young ones because our future is really safe in your hands and especially in your voices. To Blin, um, to hear you speak language, oh, look, um, it's, it's really deadly and it's something that, you know, it just uplifts you and inspires you even more. Um, I am getting a Dr. Morna, so uh, it's just, while I'm up here, Uncle, I just thought I'd take the chance. Um, <laughs> so it was really interesting, um, Dr. Morna, that um, you've uh, probably not really addressed the real, the real game, which is... Australian, Australian football rules. Um, but, you know, being at Rumbalara Football Club, I'm sure they'll show you, you know, just how technical the game is. Um, but it was interesting in terms of um, Dr. Mona's talk, how he started off with um, that, like everything, we, we do struggle to catch up with the technology sometimes and how it does race, race from us. It was interesting to sh that Dr. Mona's touched on his childhood because um, and what was really interesting to me, um, even though we live it, sometimes we don't reflect, was about how, how the cause through his childhood, his history came to life. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in that running forward that those stories are the things that make it important. 
those valuable stories from our grandparents, our mothers, our fathers, our aunties and our uncles, even from our own brothers and sisters. Um, interesting to hear about his first granddaughter, how the first thing that they learnt was Maori language, not, not English. So um, maybe there's something for um, education here to, to think about and probably do a lot more of. Um, to touch the edge of the future, all the edges of the of our past today and then into our future. Um, Dr. Mona talked about the innocence that from hardship can rise um, greatness and regardless of the oppressors, the ability to keep going forward is something that is endearing and special within every nation of Indigenous people. It was interesting to hear about the League of Nations and to, and to share the story about the wars are not ready. And from that I captured that um, even though those elders who walked back, the ability wasn't to say that we couldn't. The ability was to say that they, they stood strong in their pride to make sure that people, people their own members, realised that that government wasn't ready for them. And I think it's a telling thing in our history that for us and certainly our ancestors have laid that journey for us um, and have identified that that government wasn't ready. And in Jill's speech, she touched about the government that now is. Um, so that's really good. But part of that's um, in Jill's speech, she talked about the, the fruits of fruits at the table. So we've got a big table now. Um, but it's a journey from what comes from that. And I think Dr. Morner then captured that again by talking about how, how integrity and strength and being staying strong and proud and resilient. He mentioned the stories of violence and genocide in the history. And what, what I took away from that is what shines through the light of darkness is always about people's ability for survival and to be resilient above all else. And you know, when, when you look at the histories right across the world, you can see the resilience in history, but more importantly in our own. The Declaration of Human Rights, the humanity of people, the remarkable connection of similarity we all share. Never give up our independence, our integrity, and always make sure we stay true to our rights as Indigenous people. Always remember the land. It is, it is where we come from, that place of who we are. We are infused by our humanity, our self-determination, our right to determine for ourselves our own destiny. And for me, it was really good that that was able to be captured in terms of it, because it is our destiny. It was our elders' destiny back then. It's our destiny now, and it will be our future, and it will be their destiny going forward. Dr Mona talked about the common threads, the struggles, the victories, the land, And then, he, then Dr. Mono touched on the treaty, which I think was really interesting because so many of us have, have got confused and caught up by treaty and what it really means. And I thought Dr. Mono summed it up really great by to say it is to bring people together. And I think sometimes we never look at some of the simplest words that give, can give us the greatest of meanings. And for me, um, treaty enables exactly that, to bring people together. Acknowledging the courage to meet other people, to, to identify the imbalance of non-Indigenous culture, to always make sure you have choices. And with treaty, um, never, never give up, always make sure that it is an acceptance of sovereignty and self-determination. A recognition of place and people who are themselves getting involved in a treaty. Our nationhood and our self-determination should and always will be protected. And what was really interesting was the last, uh, well, the three points, uh, never, forget, never forget the past. And it's interesting when Dr. Mona said, it is a spur to the remedy, which he later went on to say it was a catalyst for change. And for me, sometimes it is 
the words. And for me, remedy is something that we connect to. Um, two, to shape the treaty to suit the present. Um, and one of the captions in that, which I thought was really good, was adaptation does not equal submission. And never have we as Aboriginal people ceded our sovereignty. The plan for the future. Oh, sorry, to sh number two, to shape the treaty to suit the present ad adaptation. Number three, to plan for the future, to make sure it's future proof, self determination, and it should be flexible enough, visionary enough for a strong future. Cultural history, a celebration, um, where Dr. Morner gave an example of um, the parliament and how uh, getting everyone to go around and talk about uh, their, with the minute silence, but then this uh, turn it into a celebration, um, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. Um, I, think, I think that might be something we might try. Um, our self-determination will take different forms, but it is okay to be different. And for me, it's really interesting because, you know, some self-determination has been talked about so much and we all have our own views. But I think it may, that's what makes it beautiful and that, that's what makes it a part of us being able to, to come together and to sit and talk it through. And then finally, in my closing, um, the big thing that uh, for Dr. Moore and certainly what he said was, um, let's dare to dream for our future. Because it, it is our future that will help us remember the past, shape the present, and look forward to the future. Thank you, Dr. Moore. keep sitting over there thinking after Dr. Mourner's speech, don't write anything down, you'll be right, storyteller. <laughs> then I panic. <laughs> um, but I guess um, first, just before we close, I um, just want to invite um, Uncle Paul and Professor Glenn Davis up to um, give a few gifts and thank yous. Next, we just want to ask um, Deb, Tony, Annie Rochelle, and Blynn to come up. Thank you. That was just a little gift to say thank you and um, just want to say thanks to all the organisers of tonight's DKO. I see my colleagues running around um, trying to make sure this event's um, spectacular and 
A special mention to Katrina and the staff at KI. I know that Trine's put in countless hours um, to make sure that tonight has been pulled together to be such a wonderful event. So thanks, Trine. And just, um, I wasn't asked to do this, but um, I just want to say, you know, to my colleagues and um, friends, you know, Shepparton's homes, I have many um, non-Indigenous friends here. Um, just what Dr. Morna said, you know, will you come with us and can you keep up? Um, and... Can, at, just at the end, I'd just like everyone to come to the front so we can get a group photo. Um, you know, it is a very special event, 10 years of the Dungala Kale Oration, and of course, Professor Davis's last one. So thank you, and we hope you stay to enjoy the refreshments afterwards. Thank you.